We have a very special Stupid for Movies interview today with director Dan Ireland. Uh, you probably know his name from such movies as The Whole Wide World, Mrs. Palfrey at the Claremont. This is the man who basically discovered Renee Zellweger, and uh, he has discovered another amazing actress in his latest film, Jolene, which is based on an E.L. Doctorow short story. Dan, thanks for being here. Oh, I, wait, it's a pleasure. Well, I know you've got a premiere this evening, so I know. this is why we're doing this, doing this early. And, I love uh, it. Thank you very much for doing jumping through hoops. Well, not a problem. It's, it's a tremendous film. I mean, this Thank is, uh, knowing what you went through to get this thing distributed and to see it, it, it come together so beautifully. And I, I, I honestly, I think there are some real Oscar potentials in this film. God. Uh, you have an unbelievable cast, but Jessica Chastain, the unknown, the newcomer, mm -hmm. is the one who just lights the screen up in the, in, as the lead character. Let's first talk about how this project came together. An E.L. Doctorow short story, how did, how did this fall into your lap? It, it literally fell into my lap. Um, my editor was very good friends with uh, my producer, and uh, she had another director, Paul Mazursky, as a matter of fact. Who the LA Film Critics, of which I'm a member, along with my colleague, we just gave him our Career Achievement Award And this year. deservedly so. Yeah. Well, my producer had a fight with him, uh, and, um, and they parted company. Interesting. And, and, um, and I got a phone call saying, hey, there is this E.L. Doctorow project that um, this woman is producing, and she saw your film, The Whole Wide World, and she wants to meet you. And I was like, E.L. Doctorow? You're kidding. I, I, I'd, I'd love to. I didn't know I didn't know the story. I didn't know uh, Sweetland stories, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, collection of short stories is taken from. So um, I went for dinner with her, and um, she called me the next morning at 8 o'clock and said, are you in or are you out? And I was like, I haven't even read it la you know, yet. W we just had dinner. So she was that kind of person. And um, I went, I had my coffee, I read the short story. I didn't even need to read the script. At that point, I, was, I phoned her up and said, uh, I want to do it. I really want to do it. It scared the hell out of me. Mm. And I'm a believer if anything scares you, jump at it, do it. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it, it's such a tremendous story, and, and not without giving, anything, without giving anything away, but it's the story of a, of a young girl who, in 1970s North Carolina, um, gets married, and then things in her life sort of spiral progressively out of control, and the tides of life carry her from one episode to another, and it's sort of how this, this woman grows up without ever really being in charge of her life, yet she's carried along by the tides of fate. And uh, I, I just thought it was profound and poetic. Uh, how, how difficult was it to make the film once you jumped into that pool? Uh, it, it really came together. I mean, I think we all had a vision of it. And, um, and one of the things that um, I think Riva Yaris, our producer, liked that I brought up is I said, this is like five separate paintings. Um, and one of the things that I was always intrigued by in my life is at the end of Fellini's Satyricon, um, after seeing this collage of this young man's life and going through it, and it was very episodic, and, and you saw the ruins, and you saw all the pictures at the very end of you know, the journeys of the young man's life, and it hit me how to make the film. And, um, and I wanted to do it as really five different episodes that connected into this girl's life and the, traje the trajectory that she has along the way. And especially, um, this is a child of abuse. I mean, yeah. and when you look into the eyes of a child, you know, who's been abused at 12 years old, you see something very, very different. And, um, and, and I thought trying to find the soul of this girl and to see how she thinks. And with Jessica, you know, I always love to hire an actor that will show you something about the character that it's not on the page. And it happened with Renee Zellweger. And in both cases, they both showed me something about the character that I didn't know. And with Jessica, it was her heart. And, and, and it was always, that was sort of the thing that kept Jolene going, yeah. is her belief in, you know, in finding, you know, this life for herself where she could believe. But, you know, her big mistake is that she keeps falling, mm -hmm. and, and she keeps falling in the same rut. But it's different, and, and every rut is different, yeah. and everybody 
promises her the world, and yet no one delivers. So, you know, and at the end of the film, we leave her there, you know, I think with a semblance of hope. You do. You well, do. I wanted to put her, that whole metaphor, putting her right in front of Fredericks of Hollywood yeah. and walking down Hollywood Boulevard, was there was a girl that was still able to dream mm -hmm. on the street of broken dreams. Yeah. And, and I had watched Knights of Kiberia just accidentally um, one night, when right in the midst of before we started the film, and w I was just, I forgot how much I loved the film, and that last shot of Julieta Messina walking down the Appian Way, and just sort of that strength and that fortitude and that knowledge that she's had, even though she kept repeating the yeah. same mistakes. So Jolene's a little, Julieta Messina, she's a little, yeah. Dr. O, she's a little Renee Zellweger, she's a little Jessica Chastain, she's, yeah. Well, it's, uh, do you mind talking about the budget? What was the budget on the film? Um, it was around five million dollars. That's incredible, because your cast, yeah. I mean, Francis Fisher, uh, yeah. Chaz Palminteri, Dermot Mulroney, uh, Michael Varton, I mean, uh, on and on and on. This is just an incredible cast. How do you get so many great actors with yeah. such limited resources, how did, what, what drew them? Was it the material? Was yeah. it Dr. O? Completely. Yeah? Completely. Um, uh, I didn't think that they really knew my work at that point, so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm blaming it on Dr. <laughs> o, and it, he's a nice guy to blame it on. And, and he has reacted very positively to the film, hasn't he? Yeah, he sure has. That, that blew me away. He didn't want me to do it at first. Hmm. He saw the whole wide world and he was all for me. And then he saw Mrs. Palfrey at the Claremont and thought that 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 I was maybe perhaps too soft, mm -hmm. you know, like because of the treatment of Mrs. Palfrey, yeah. which is really a chamber piece, and you know, and had to be treated as a chamber piece. It wasn't Harold and Maud where they, you know, got together and had sex and she went <laughs> off and killed herself. It was a very different, you know, genteel yeah. piece. And he looked at it and he was afraid that I wasn't going to be able to hand the rougher, you know, parts of um, of his story. And, and after um, a half an hour conversation at six o'clock in the morning, when I was in Seattle promoting Mrs. Palfrey at the Claremont, um, and I had to call him up, um, he changed his mind, and mm. lucky for me. And he was, I was terrified. First time we went to show it to him, I sat in the back row, and I just watched his reaction. And, um, I didn't know what to think, and he came up at the end and he hugged me. And um, but he hasn't—he didn't see the full film until three months ago. Talk about this had a bit of a nightmare distribution history too. I mean, this yeah. film should have been released two years ago. Yeah. W and finally that it's coming out, I think those of us who've tracked it for that long are breathing a sigh of relief because so many good films just don't get distributed these days. Uh, talk about the minefield. The minefield was imminent it was just it was there I mean I personally wanted the film to be 10 minutes shorter and my producer and I um, disagreed because I knew if I'd made it 10 minutes shorter it would have gotten out a lot quicker mm -hmm. but she stood by her um, her guns because she loved the vision that that we did and um, she didn't want to shorten it and I really did I still do but but that's when have you ever heard of a director strong-arming a producer to shorten their film? Good point. You know, when has there been a director's yeah. cut that's been shorter, shorter. than a producer's <laughs> cut? Well, I, I, I want it, but still, I don't, I don't really care. It, right now, I'm so thrilled it's out. Um, I think probably a lot of the problems were we really didn't have big names, because um, right now even indies have to have huge names yeah. to get out there. And it's a risky film. And also, we had five offers. Um, she didn't like any of them, and she was bound and determined, my producer, Riva, uh, she was bound and determined to get the right person. And then um, E1 came along and um, said all the right things, have done all the right things, and they're, they've been amazing. Hmm. They've been just amazing. Great. Yeah. So I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm blown away. I'm kind of sort of stunned, because tonight's sort of the premiere, and I'm like, really? Yeah. Is it really happening after it's, all this time? It's happening. Well, I, we'll, we'll get you out of here in just a moment. And I want to touch also on Rupert Friend, who is yeah. one of the, the long-standing 
uh, train of men who sort of uh, fall into her life here. The second time you've worked with him, totally different performance from Mrs. Palfrey. Completely. Uh, and you know, I, I, we were talking even before this, not an actor that I normally respond to so well, mm -hmm. but in your films you get something out of him that really, really clicks with me. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about uh, your relationship with him, because this is the second time around. Well, I looked at 75 guys for, um, for Ludo in Mrs. Mm -hmm. Palfrey, and it came down to two people. It came down to Dominic Cooper, who was on stage at the time, at the National doing the History Boys and Rupert. But I was all set to go with Dominic. I was completely convinced. But I had to equal Joan Plowright. And I knew unless I found an actor that could go head and shoulders with her that the film would never ever work. Rupert walked in. He was the very last guy in out of like 75 people my casting director wanted to kill me. Always my casting directors want to kill me because I usually will do that until I find the right person I'll just keep seeing people. And um, Rupert walked in and that was it. I knew, I knew it was him and I don't know why. There's an instinct I think that you get like after you've been lucky and I was really lucky with uh, Renee, I was really lucky with Emmy Rossum, I was really lucky with Thomas Jane. Um, and I learned in that period of time to trust my instinct. And I think what I said to you earlier, look for the actor that shows you something about the part and the character that you don't know and, and gives you something there that you all of a sudden connect the sum and the total of the person. Well, Rupert came in and he owned it. He owned it. And um, from that point on, it was just, it was Rupert. And even though his role in Mrs. Palfrey was, you know, much more gentle and, and and soulful, um, I knew he could do this guy. Yeah. I, and I knew he wanted to do this guy. I knew he wanted to be dark. But hey, how about Michael Vartan? Amazing. From, from like, you really know. Really amazing. Monster-in-Law and, yeah. and um, what was the Drew Barrymore film he did? Um, yeah. To, uh, Never Been Kissed, yeah. I think. And um, he was also in The Paul Bearer, which, uh, which a friend right. of mine directed, so yeah. Oh yeah, well he came into me and he said, I don't want to be the romantic co uh, comedy guy anymore. I'll do anything to play this guy. And I saw such commitment and passion in him that I just, it's I a, wanted to go with him. It's a tough part. That's a tough it's part a, too. It's, it's almost impossible. Yeah. And he, he's so perfect. He has to be pious and violent and believable in both. And, and charming and, and a, charming. a jerk. Yeah. And, and then, you know what, but you can't resist him. You can't. I, and he's overpowering. And she can't either. Well, you know, yeah. and he plays it so perfectly yeah. and his turn is, is so... Magnificent. Yeah. It's a tough scene to watch. Oh, and Francis Fisher, I mean, had never done anything like that. It was really, I think the actors really came to it. And I'm just sort of thinking about your question before, why they did it. I don't think they'd ever done roles quite like that yeah. before, and um, and and I wanted to go with it with them. I mean, working on a film—it's the greatest fun of working with an actor is your yeah. collaboration. Well, you did a great job. Uh, oh, we'll, thank you. We'll we'll let you get out of here to your premiere, Dan Ireland. Thank you so much oh, for for taking wait, time for our you. for our show. Thank you. It's uh, Jolene is the film. It is uh, based on a short story by E.L. Doctorow, uh, and it is a tremendous film, and it has had a, a long, tumultuous path coming to theaters. But for all of our fans and all of our viewers, please go out, find this film, find Jolene. You will not be disappointed. And uh, honestly, it, uh, you know, there's, always, it, there's always Oscar buzz around the little films. I think it's, wow. you know, I really, really feel like Jessica Chastain has a, has a oh, real dark horse chance. You know, she's I done do. nine films since my film. There you go. My film got her into Tree of Life like, and like the rest Renee again. Of it. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you find them. You have a knack for it. Well, thanks, Dan. Thanks, and there we go. We're going to let him go to his premiere. Thank and you. We'll, uh, we'll see you again. Stupid for movies. <laughs>